Welcome back. You're watching The Last Sip, and I'm Amara Jones. There have been a wave of first-time and progressive candidates who are running for office in 2018, but at the same time, there continues to be an era of backlash in which politics maneuvers at this particular moment. And so in order to explore some of the other cross-currents besides that of progressivism that are at work, we are joined again by Hannah Alam of BuzzFeed, who will take us through that in a way, hopefully, that doesn't have us pulling our hair out. Hannah, thanks again for joining us. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, um, progressivism does seem to be resurging in the United States. We just had a conversation with Ben Jealous about how he feels that in his state it's become a movement. It's not only that he's running on certain issues, but that um, it's a part of a broader change in the political level. But as we have learned from 2016, and as continues to play out in a lot of ways in 2018, we're also in an era of backlash against um, a series of rights and different groups of people. And one of those that was at work in 2016 um, was clearly um, a backlash against Muslims and Islamophobia that was in many ways a part of Donald Trump's campaign in 2016. Sure. Well, I think that uh, Islamophobia has been around a long time, even long before 9-11, which, of course, after 9-11, there was sort of this whole industry that sprang up a multi-million dollar industry to discredit and vilify Muslims um, at, at home and abroad. And uh, that industry was very influential on U.S. politics, especially Republican politics, and definitely um, influential within the Trump campaign. Uh, what many people who watch Islamophobia and anti-Muslim hostility saw was that these groups that were once considered fringe, they would say things, you know, blanket vilifications of, of Muslims. You know, there's 1.6 billion in the world, three and a half million here in the United States. And they would make these, um, these blanket statements uh, against Muslims. And groups that would, would do those things didn't have a seat at the table. What we've seen after the election is that not only do they have a seat at the table, um, many of those same figures that were once considered too fringe to be on a panel in Washington are now in, inside the White House, and uh, and if not directly inside the White House, maybe uh, just a degree or two removed as advisors and consultants. And so that's a trend that's extremely um, worrisome to to a lot of people, Muslims, but as as well as others, including um, progressive politicians. How is Islamophobia used? I guess I would say from what you've been able to observe and through your coverage. Sure. Uh, not long ago, a colleague, Talal Ansari, and I sat down and decided to ask the question, you know, we see these uh, anti-Muslim comments being said by a legislator here, a mayor here, a sheriff there, and we thought, what if we tallied them all up? How many states could we say has an openly Islamophobic politician, an elected official? And we found 49 out of 50 states have uh, such a person, you know, serving in office. And that, um, that was, it was chilling for a lot of people to see it in, all in one place, even if you're familiar with the statements um, from, that come out from time to time. This was an aggregation of those. And it really, I must say that most of these comments had been made with impunity. So there was no political consequence um, for, for saying the kinds of things that range from, you know, sort of litmus tests on how patriotic you are before a Muslim could meet with a, with an elected official, um, anti-Sharia legislation, um, anti-refugee remarks, the vilification of Islam, all the way up to Facebook and social media posts that were very disparaging against Islam. I would say that some even could qualify as hate speech. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, and these were by and large Republicans. I think we found maybe a couple of instances of Democrats making um, sort of similar remarks, but this was clearly a trend within the GOP. And when we asked the, the GOP what it was doing about this and whether it had identified this, um, you know, they, they said such political rhetoric is, such anti-Muslim rhetoric is unacceptable, um, but they stopped short of saying that they would um, take any action. And of course, it's hard to when that same rhetoric is, uh, you, you hear it coming from the highest office in the land. What do you think is the link between Islamophobia um, and the surge um, in 
heated, that's a nice term, political rhetoric against immigrants and immigration overall. Are they moving in tandem? Um, are they opposite? So the more there's um, uh, a focus on Islamophobia, uh, there's less on immigration or vice versa. What's the, in, what's the interplay here? Because my, my interest here is in this idea of um, othering and, the fo and, quote, the foreigner and the way in which that is used politically. And so is there a relationship between Islamophobia and, and the broader conversation on immigration? Oh, absolutely. They go part and parcel. I mean, for, for example, you know, in discussing American Muslims, uh, President Trump and, uh, you know, White House staff, they, they almost never, if ever, um, acknowledge that there are Muslim Americans here, you know, in many capacities. Thank you so much for your reporting. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us, not once, but twice. Um, and um, we greatly appreciate it. Um, and we'll be right back.